Hi, welcome to A Watchman's Journal. I'm Diana Larkin. We are going to be looking at another prophetic dream tonight with John Redenbow of Dream Life Decoded and Brian Palencia of Love Has a Name YouTube channel. Brian had this dream and it's pretty amazing. Um, it's there's going to be a lot to unlock here. So, uh, John and Brian, welcome. Thank you for coming back. So good to be here. Thank you, Diana. Excited to hear what the Lord will reveal. Yes, indeed. <laughs> we are going to begin with Brian just sharing the raw dream with us. And then hopefully, um, John and I will have something to share <laughs> about that <laughs> dream. So, this was. Um, the dream was at a diner with DJT and Don Jr. So, Brian, what was this dream? Oh, yeah. So, this dream uh, came to me on January 25th, 2024. And I specifically uh, remember that this was as I was as I was waking up in the morning in that in-between state where many of us will hear things and see things in the spirit and I entitled this at a diner with DJT and Don Jr. So there are three sections. Um, I believe this is in order, fair warning. <laughs> but the first thing I wrote down was the very thing that Don Jr. Jr. spoke to me directly. And I didn't want to forget. So we'll start with that. So uh, paragraph one. This is how I started. Don Jr. is looking at me and he says, there's only one time they went backwards. It was 1898. I didn't understand what he meant. Sounded like he meant that the president, whomever it was at the time, and another, and I put here possibly the VP, in reference to something they did in order to appear like they were going backwards. But I got the sense that it was a part of the plan. I didn't fully grasp what he meant. So I guess that's kind of like the climax. But now we, we need to give you the backstory. So I do have a little visual. Um, you know what? Maybe I will show this now. Hopefully the mm -hmm. light will not reflect. And if anything, people can just kind of have it in their mind as I'm, as I'm sharing. Let's see. Well, let me know. There. Oh, there it is. Yeah. All right. So hopefully you all can see. Uh, the main thing you need to know, this is an aerial view. And please know that this is the window, the front of the diner, and the light is shining in. And then you have the different people around. So if you need to pause the video, feel free just to get that visual in you. And so what, uh, what I wrote next was the second paragraph. So as you can tell from the visual, I was sitting at a table and Don Jr. was on my right. There was an empty spot across from the table where there was a, um, what do you call that? Like a booth where there aren't chairs, but it's just a long booth to sit in. And I wrote down that I take a step of faith and I went ahead and I moved my, uh, I got up from my chair and I sat across from where I was onto the bench. I, I wanted to sit across from Don Jr. Um, and I believe it's because I had some insight to share. I noticed at that moment, there was a woman who was sitting there now at my left. And it was a, a white woman, but I do not know who she was. I just got that sense. So in terms of the visual, she was sitting across from Don Jr. To her left, there was a man who was um, a little bit heavy set. I'll say it that way. Uh, he had a, a rounded uh, head, his face, nose, cheekbones seemed to be a little bit uh, reddish, almost like patchy. Um, kind of like, I guess, Santa Claus, if you want to think of it that way, if you're not offended by that. <laughs> you can kind of imagine someone like that. And he was sitting in a, in a chair off to the side. Next to him on his left, this is where I noticed that DJT was sitting at the table. He was more so by the corner of the table. Next to him, we all, we've gone all the way around now, to his left was Don Jr. 
And okay, now I'm gonna fast forward to the last part here. When I moved to sit across Don Jr., I did it so that I could see DJT and the white man a little bit better. I wanted to share what I was perceiving. Now I'm just gonna pause it for a moment. Um, I didn't write down what it was because I don't think I knew when I woke up and I was <laughs> writing this. I don't know what I was perceiving. <laughs> Uh, a lot of question marks, but apparently I had some sort of insight that I wanted to share. So when I moved over, um, then Don, then I remember Don had been speaking to me. That's when he had said what he said. I also noticed that behind DJT, the sun was shining in from the window, which was several feet away. The sun was shining in very, very brightly. And it illuminated the area behind DJT. And as I was looking at Don Jr., for some reason, the light coming from behind him um, made his face seem translucent. And that just means it wasn't completely clear, you know, like a see-through, but it was a, a little bit translucent kind of in between. And then his face was no longer Don Jr.'s face. It now looked like the younger version of DJT. So imagine him perhaps in his 30s. So literally, I was looking at a younger version of DJT and behind him, the current DJT and how he looks now. When I saw this and I didn't understand, two words came to me spiritually, strength and wisdom. And in that moment, I knew that these two words symbolized the younger and older DJTs and two attributes working together. As I told Don Jr. about his face looking translucent at a certain angle, suddenly my mom appeared uh, on the neighboring table, I suppose, and she, con she looked at him and she also saw it. So that served a conf as a confirmation to me in this dream, in the encounter, that what I was seeing was as it was. Um, and then lastly, I, I think I'm mistyped here, but I meant to write Don Jr. seemed very friendly uh, with me, towards me. So that was the end of the dream. Wow. Um, okay, so the setting is a diner, which is kind of like all American. That, you know, the American diner is uh, American. <laughs> And you said it reminded you of a silver diner, which that's not a chain I'm familiar with, but silver speaks of redemption. So I think that that's really cool that that's, that's where true. this dream takes place. Um, and of course, 1898 has got to have a lot to do with unlocking uh, this dream. Um, I'm going to let John uh, take take it away here, but I'll just mention that what the dream said to me is you're getting a different perspective on Don Jr. and DJT and the relationship mm -hmm. between them. But there's a whole lot more going on in this dream than just that. So, uh, John, give us your uh, initial impressions here. Mm, wow. Another incredible, amazing dream. I always want to tell people how wonderful their dreams are, but it's not their fault. <laughs> you didn't give yourself the dream. So you can't take any pride in it. But this is this is a really, really, really fun, cool dream. And we're going to get into some crazy stuff. All right. Uh, but I want to put, I want to kind of table the uh, the phrase for a minute because there's a lot that we're going to uncover there that's going to take a while. And I want to talk about the seating and what's happening actually in the context of the dream. It's so interesting to me. A lot of times, <laughs> especially my prophetic friends, because they're so used to hearing, they'll have a dream and there'll be all of this stuff that's like, I'm sitting here and then I move here and then this happens and I see this and this person that, but because they're verbal type of people, they're used to hearing the voice of God, like they key in on what is said. And it's like, this is what's really important is what's being said 
um, in the dream. And so I think it's really interesting to see what's happening in the dream and then go from there. So <clears throat> the idea of sitting at the table reminds me of the verse in scripture that says, when you sit down to dine with a king, put a knife to your throat, right? So that you don't say anything inappropriate or dumb is probably how we would say it <laughs> um, and embarrass yourself in the presence of a prince. So it particularly mm -hmm. says when you sit down to dine with a king, you don't want to bear, embarrass yourself in the presence of a prince, which means more than just the king is going to be there. I think it's super yeah. interesting that you're sitting next to Don Jr., who could be considered a prince in certain contexts, and his dad is next to him, who you would consider a king in the context of executive authority, right? <clears throat> um. Yeah, there's across from you is an empty seat, and it's actually um, kind of a uh, booth like it's like that half booth. Mm -hmm. Yes, but it's it's an empty seat, which is interesting. But what's also really really fascinating is you're diagonally across the table, almost exactly when you move from where Trump himself is sitting. Room. yeah from one corner to the other corner in a sense right yes from one corner to the other corner and <laughs> i don't think if i recall correctly that anybody is actually sitting at the head of the table is that right that is correct there's the heavy set man in a chair that's off to if you're standing at, at the end of the table between where you were and where you shifted to and you're looking out the window, mm -hmm. there's two people at kind of where the head of the table would be, but they're kind of sharing that head of the table space. And that would be the heavy set man and President Trump. Mm -hmm. And yes. next to them are the white woman and Don Jr. And then next to those people at the other end of the table are you and you. And nobody is at the reverse head of the table, which I think is interesting. What I think is also interesting is it talks about what's the parable that, you know, says if you get invited to a dinner, take a seat of lowly position so that the master or the king can say, come up here, because again, it's better to be called up than embarrassed in the presence of a prince and said, hey, you need to go sit down there. And so I think it's really interesting that from the seat that you were to the seat that you are now, you didn't really change position as far as ranking because you're at the lowest seat pretty much because you're about as far away from the king as you can get, even though it's just a couple of chairs, right? You're not seated yeah. at the head. Trump is sharing the head of the table with the heavy set white guy, Santa Claus, whatever that is. Um <clears throat> But so for you to move from the position that you are to the position that you end up, you're, you're not really, you're not really changing in a place of rank, but what you're able to do, several things shift. You're able to face Don Jr. and speak to him directly. You're able to get a better view on both the, the heavy set white guy and the president himself. And from this place, now your seer view really kicks in and you're able to notice the sunlight coming through, streaming through the window. And you're like, wow, the president himself and Don Jr., initially the president, looks translucent. And then you're like, well, now Don Jr. looks translucent. And now it looks like um, DJT is actually younger than he is. Did I get all that right? Um, yes, but I will say that the translucent was only on Don Jr. Only on so Don the, Jr. But specifically the light when it was coming in, it was, the way I saw it is it was behind Trump. Like mm -hmm. 
it, I didn't even think of, you know, the other white man as, oh, because I didn't know who he was. Mm -hmm. So in terms of significance, the light was behind uh, DJT first, but I saw the transformation in his son, in the in his face. So, And you said his son looked 20 or 30 years younger? So, yeah, just imagine, imagine, you know, DJT as he is now, but then his son turned into what DJT looked like um, when he was in his 30s, maybe half half the age. Um, yeah. So it, I literally felt like it was two DJTs there. I no, no longer even thought Don Jr. because it mm -hmm. seemed like it was current DJT and uh, younger DJT, like in the same spot. And I was just a little bit confused when I saw that. Um, yeah, I, I yeah. even before I, the, the broadcast today, I was thinking to myself, in the experience or in the dream, I didn't think of his his other son, although he kind of looks a little bit more. Um, his other son looked a little bit more what DJ T looked like when he was younger, uh, with the blonde hair um, and whatnot. But I don't know if that could play a part um, because I know his other son and his wife are are strong voices. Um, right now and in, in speaking out truth and whatnot yeah interesting so don jr is 46 right now which i think is interesting because that puts him um you said about 20 to 30 years I see probably in his thirties. Okay. Yeah, if I had to roughly. So you said, yeah, thirty years difference. Or is that what you were feeling? Just feeling in terms of uh, how he looked. Right. <laughs> wow, this plays out nicely. <laughs> the... <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna see if I can find a a, a picture. <clears throat> More or less. Well, tell us what you're thinking, John. Well, we got to go into that statement. Um, okay. And then we have to uh, time travel. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> we have to find out this 1898 phrase and what the heck does that mean? Mm -hmm. That um, was very specific. Yes. Yes. So I, I think all of this is a setup for you. First of all, let's talk about what it says about you. Excuse me, because I don't want to leave this part out. It says that you're one who sits down to dine with kings hmm. and princes. Hmm. Wow. And you're not just a guy at a table. You're at a seat of honor. You are actually able. Now, if you go to a White House dinner or something like that, you don't move seats. <laughs> it's very scripted state dinners like you're not just picking up your chair and get, you know and especially when you have the president and his son like you don't just move your chair like that doesn't happen you know the the secret service are there they know everything about you and where you're going to sit and what's going to go on and who's going to present what and when this course is going to come out and what time and i mean it's 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 a whole different animal than you and I having macaroni and cheese for lunch or something. I mean, <laughs> you know, even if you are at a diner, like, and so I think it's really interesting that you have these characters like the Santa Claus guy. And then um, your mom, which is the, at least the second dream that I know of that we've had with your mom in it. So I think that's that's fascinating. But what I'm really fascinated with is, first of all, the setup about how you're there with royalty and then how you're next to, which is like an equal station, to be next to somebody is to be, you know, to be able to lean over and be like, hey, how do you like mm -hmm. the steak? You know, but then to <laughs> turn around and be directly in front of, not off to the side, like directly in front of, then you can engage at that level with that person, which wow. I think is really cool. And it's wow. from that new location 
that you're really taken by what you see. You say specifically, I can see the heavy set man, I can see DJT, and I can see Don Jr. all better, but then I can also see this illumination of the sun's rays coming through behind DJT and then kind of making Don Jr. look about 30 years younger and seem translucent. Almost, I don't want to put words in your mouth, Brian, but almost like a spiritual presence or a spiritual type of thing. When somebody's translucent, they look almost like they're there, but they're not there. You right. know, I'm not saying yeah. Don Jr. is an angel. <laughs> <laughs> he would probably <laughs> find that offensive. <laughs> but uh, it's just interesting. The change of position, mm -hmm. um, what you see, and then the drop in the age, you know, three decades, and then the different juxtaposition of how we see the sun's rays, how the rays are behind Trump. So you can see the strong figure like in front, but with all this backlighting, not that the light is coming up over his head, but it's going like crossways behind him, you know, <clears throat> and then it's almost like the light is on Don Jr. And because of that, positioning he begins to look a little bit translucent and then it looks like he's a whole lot younger than he actually is today yeah i wonder wow. if there was something about the bench you know um brian's been on the bench waiting but he's being put into play now hmm. yeah the difference between a bench and a seat mm-hmm the, the idea of being benched versus the only two people on the bench are him and the lady next to him, which we don't know who she is. Either of you have any sense who the lady is? I No, I did not. Um, I don't even remember. It was more of a sense of there's a there's a white lady over here. <laughs> I can't even, I mean, I, I, you know, I almost assume blonde. I don't really think, you know, black hair or red hair. It just it's almost like it was just a sensing um mm -hmm. in, in my feeler, I suppose, uh, with no detail. And then the gentleman who was next to her uh reminded me a little bit like Rick Joyner, but that's only what I was reminded of. It's not that it was him, it's not that it was Santa Claus, <laughs> just someone with <laughs> rosy cheeks, like when you're getting really cold and whatnot. Um and, and I did I demeanor. what's that? And a joyful demeanor. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, and then he didn't he didn't say anything. It was very interesting. Um and this is more or less the, the picture that I saw when Don looked mm. uh wow DJT at around that age, basically. Mm. If that helps. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm assuming mm. that's around 30. Oh <laughs> so, wow. How old is DJT right now? Do you know Diana? 70 something like 76 i thought that he was could... 77 if i'm not sure yeah so, i think you might I know be there right was something significant about that yes yes he may be turning 78 just yeah minutes. he could be june 14th june 21st 14th 14th, 14th. Yeah. okay so he's 77 now yeah. okay that's fascinating so mm -hmm. oh yeah 30, 31 years ago, 30 years ago, 31 after June, um, he was 46, which is the age of Don Jr. Mm. Oh, it's interesting. Wow. Like, wow. He's, you know, about 30 yeah. years younger. Wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So positioning, the difference between the bench and the seat. Um, I, I heard Nancy Pelosi when he said the lady, um, but I'm like, what? Like, why would... <laughs> would Trump even have dinner with her? <laughs> but when you talk about being benched, I'm like, well, that's interesting because she she sat in a place of power. It wasn't really the bench, but it was, you know, it was the Speaker of the House. But she's not in that position any longer. She's been benched. Um, so I think that that is interesting, but it changes the whole dynamic, obviously, of what you would think the meal was. But you're not talking food and you're not talking conversation. You're talking about a positioning, a movement, 
a different perspective, a confirmation of that perspective, and then this statement. So that's the key parts of the dream. You know, the positioning, where are you when you sit down to dine with a king? You're in this chair, a seat, a seat of authority versus a bench. You actually not only change position, you change authority levels. We think of bench like the, the baseball or the basketball bench. It's like being set out of the game. But I, I also think of like a Supreme Court bench. Somebody that's on the bench is somebody that's in a pro, pro position to adjudicate. And so you went from being in a seat of authority to being a judge in this place, which is why I believe that this part of this dream is an identity and destiny dream for you. Wow. That's awesome. Standing before King, sitting before mm -hmm. King, mm -hmm. you know, you're right next wow. to the Prince where there's a whole protocol of who sits where and how far away they sit and who sits next to who and, you know, the, the president at the head of the table and then his family right next and then who's next to his family. That's a position of honor. And so you're in that place of honor and then you move. So you're in more of a place of, and not that it's less of a place of honor, though, though it might actually be, because now you're not sitting next to the family of the president, you're sitting, but you're in more of a place to be able to engage. So it may look like a demotion where well, people could say that you are benched might also put you in a position to judge better. And in the place of judging better, you can see more clearly because when you get there, now you can see, now you notice, oh, look at the sun's rays. Look at what it's doing to DJT. I can see face to face with Don Jr., which is the next generation. Right. And I can see Trump better and I can see this person next to Trump, you know, better. Um, but then you're also able to notice the transformation that takes place in Don Jr. much better than if you were seated next to him. In fact, seated next to him, you probably wouldn't see it at all yeah. because of the way that the light would be hitting. This was a light intensive shift it's because of the sun's rays, it sounds like, you didn't say that exactly, but because of the sun's rays, it looks like is what's creating a level of the translucence and therefore the transformation into about 30 years younger. And so then, like you said, it wow. looks like, it looks like two DJTs next to each other, an older one and a younger one. And I don't know, but for me, this dream gave me a different perspective of Don Jr. Because I had kind of like put him to the side because he is so um, hot, hot headed. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. But that's in his dad, too, is just become tempered with wisdom over the years. And I haven't seen him having as much input as I have the other son who, Eric. um, yeah. yeah. And I, yes. I believe he is going to have great input, um, in the way that DJT comes back and governs, but, uh, I haven't seen that role for Don Jr., but there's obviously a strength of his passion that he's bringing that will keep President Trump buoyed and focused. I almost think he had to have the personality he has because he bears the name. <laughs> because he is Don Trump, Donald Trump as well. Versus Eric is different, but Eric is, seems very measured, mature, conservative. And so you think, who do you want running a country or a multi-billion dollar organization? We tend to look at somebody that's more judicious and more, more um, discerning by what would appear. But then you think, who do you want to go to war with? <laughs> you want the guy that's <laughs> as crazy as you are sitting in the fox. Well, hey, let's go take this hill. And like, yeah, you know, and yeah. if you get captured, you know, this guy's going to come after you. And that's the Don Jr. thing when it comes to, and that's what I love about him is he's got that spit and vinegar that his dad has. He doesn't take any guff from media, doesn't take no for an answer, you know? And so 
what do we need as president? Well, it depends. Are we mopping up the deep state or are we in the reconstruction phase? It's like the difference between Grant and Lincoln. You know, a lot of people said Lincoln was never destined for reconstruction because that just wasn't his role. Though I look at how forgiving he was about how he sent all the Confederate generals home who were the guys that seceded, who were the guys that stirred up war, who was the, guy, the guys that were responsible, in my opinion, for the death of hundreds of thousands of Americans. And he said, take their guns and let them go home. And I'm like, mm. I don't know if I'm man enough to do that. I don't know if I have the temperance that Lincoln had. I, I, I watched some of those old docu-series that were made in the 50s. And, you know, even when they announced that the, the Civil War was over, you know, they show that famous scene where he pokes his head out of the window at the White House and everybody is just like, wow, this is amazing. And what are we going to do now, Mr. President? Well, we're going to rebuild and blah, blah, blah. And then a band shows up and then they strike up the battle hymn of the Republic. And then Lincoln says, what's that other song? Dixieland and play Dixieland. And the crowd is ticked. And he's like, no, 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 no. I want to hear that song. And, and like people are like booing him and the band plays it anyway. And it's like beginning the heal. But he's, he was so in your face even about the shift that, you know, and it was what, four days later, I think he went to Ford's theater. But so, yeah, the difference between and, and by the way, there's a reason we're talking about Lincoln. Um, I don't know if we mentioned this on this show before, but. Lincoln had an apparition, they call it. Um, I have I have a book written by Ward Hill Layman, Recollections of Lincoln. I think it's 1860 to 1865. And Ward Hill Layman was his business partner, went to Washington with him, was his probably his best friend other than Mary Todd, and was also his bodyguard. Mm -hmm. And so firsthand account and information. Wow. When, when Lincoln would have a dream, he would tell Mary Todd, and he would tell Ward Hill Layman. And Ward Hill Layman wrote this book, and it was published in 1865. So very mm -hmm. credible firsthand information. But he talks about, there's one whole chapter on dreams, uh, visions, and apparitions. And this is one of the apparitions, is he gets done after a long day, and he goes into his bedroom or office or whatever it was, and he lays down on the couch and he looks up at the bureau and the bureau had one of those tilted mirrors and he sees a reflection of himself completely laid out. But then he sees another reflection of just his face. And he's like, what? And so he gets up and he goes over and he adjusts the mirror and he's looking for the light. Where's the light coming through? Where's this other reflection coming through? And then he lays back down again. And again, he sees his whole body laid out on the couch but then next to it, he sees this other face, but he looks more gaunt. He looks gray. He looks really worn. And he was like, where is that coming from? And, you know, it's no, he can't figure it out. He gets called into a meeting. He comes home later or comes back to his office later. <laughs> Same thing. It happens three times. And after it happens three times, he tries to recreate it for Mary Todd. It doesn't work. Um, it, after three times, he can never recreate it again. And so Mary Todd said, and by the way, be careful who interprets your stuff, because, because Mary Todd said, yeah. because there were two of you in the mirror, I believe it means you're going to win a second term. But because there was, you were gray and gaunt and worn, I think it also means you're going to die during your second term. Hmm. And he did win and he did die. Wow. And so if we see two DJTs next to each other, and one is looking much younger than before. It's like the opposite of the Lincoln apparition, which is crazy. And again, it was wow. about light and the way the light came in. And you think of sunlight and even sunlight because the way this the light hit the sun, Don Jr. Like there's just, you know, I put illuminated by sun and sun. Wow. <laughs> just the way that you describe that. And so I think that understanding that history is just important to know. Uh, I'm wondering if now, now it's different. It's not obviously the same. It's not a mirror. It's not the president by himself. It's not a reflection, but what's more of a reflection than a son named after you. And so it's interesting that 30 years younger, and then you heard, you heard strength and wisdom 
And it's almost like the juxtaposition of the two, the older DJT wisdom, the younger DJT strength, you know? And so what does this mean? Does this mean Trump's going to have two terms? Does this mean Don Jr. is going to have a shot at the presidency after Trump? Um, the I don't believe the dream provides us enough intelligence for us to understand that exactly. Um, but let's go into the words and into what was said. You said yeah. Don Jr. looked at you and said only one time they went backwards, 1898. So I'll tell you the second thing that I felt led to look up, and then we'll go into the first thing. The second thing I felt led to look up was Presidency 1898. The president was William McKinley. Um, <clears throat> he was an American politician. He was the 25th president of the United States from 1897 till his assassination in 1901. Yeah. A member of the Republican Party, he held a realignment. He led a realignment that made the Republicans largely dominant in the industrial states and nationwide for decades. I think, could that be indicative of the MAGA movement? I don't know. It's just interesting. Look for the parallels is what I'm looking mm -hmm. for. Go backward mm -hmm. to 1898. He presided over the victory in the Spanish-American War. Mm-hmm. Oh, you mean like an incursion across borders <laughs> from the southern side kind of a thing? Well, that's interesting. Just the one thing I thought about with the Spanish-American War is that we have two Hispanics and two white people at the table. His mom was kind of behind him, but yeah. I just thought that was interesting. That, that is interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. True. Wow. He restored prosperity after a deep depression. He rejected the inflationary monetary policy of free silver or free money, keeping the nation on the gold standard and raising protective tariffs. And he was the last president to have served in the American Civil War. Hmm. So I think there's a lot of that that's super, wow. super interesting. Yeah. Um. But I got to tell you what I heard, and this is going to take us down a little bit different of a path, is I heard Baron Trump. Okay. And I'm like, wait a minute, what are those books? What are those books that are written by Baron Trump? And it's the adventures of little Baron Trump and his wonderful dog, Bulger, and Baron Trump's marvelous underground journey. And the first one was published in 1889. So it's 98 backwards. And then the second was published, I think, in uh, 1893. Now, there's a whole theory <clears throat> um, in certain circles, because this was all rediscovered. The fact that there was an author named Baron Trump that wrote books back in that age, that era, there's this whole idea of uh, Trump's dad knew Tesla. Was there time travel involved in the Trump family? And it's really interesting because of the one book that I haven't mentioned yet, and it wasn't in 1898, but it was actually published in the year 1900. And the name of the book is the last president. And what's really interesting is this book is about um, a hotly contested 21st century political climate set in America, torn by division and dissent. There are references to a hotel on Fifth Avenue in New York and an election of an outsider candidate ensuing in a chaotic atmosphere written in 1900 by baron trump Whoa. wow so it, it people have been again there's the whole tesla connection there's the whole is it possible that somebody time traveled back to 1898 because the book was published in 19 1900 literally two years later 
So I think the first book was published in 1889, again, which is 98 backwards. It's like, what? And then <laughs> if they went backwards in 1898, the political climate under McKinley was very much like the climate that it is today. And then they're talking in this book about the last American president, and they're talking about a political climate that sounds very much like the 21st century, a lot of division, um, and all of these things. And so I was like, and it's interesting because you said we need to unlock what 1898 means. This book was written by Ingersoll Lockwood, hmm. Baron Trump collection. <laughs> You know, Baron Trump's and the first one, Baron Trump's uh, marvelous underground journey. You know, if you think of, again, underground, the tunnels, human trafficking. Yes. Um, I mean, it's just uncanny that although no, the first one was the adventures of little Baron and his wonderful dog, Bulger. Okay. The second one was Baron Trump's marvelous underground journey. And then the last president which was 1900. Yeah, the the, uh, the underground journey was in 1893. 1889 for the first one, 1893 for the second one, and then 1900 for the last president. And so <clears throat> what's really fascinating as well is um, McKinley was the 25th president of the United States. Whoever wins this election, um, because very, it's probably very unlikely that most people believe that Biden will even be on the ballot by the time we have the election. Whoever wins the election will be the 47th president of the United States um, if we go concurrently as we've gone numbering presidents the way we are now. There's a whole discussion on what about 1871 and you know, was Grant the last president? And there's that. There's a lot of discussion that's way beyond the scope here. But <clears throat> forty-seven and twenty-five is twenty-two years, and of course, a lot of us see the number twenty-two is Isaiah twenty-two, twenty-two, Daniel two, twenty-two. I believe the number twenty-two, or especially two, 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 is the quintessential number of spiritual intelligence because of Daniel two, twenty-two. He, you know, he knows the deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness, light dwells with him. And by the way, this would not be the first time that God has talked to me or others in a dream, that a dream has come across our desk that has to do almost blatantly with the concept of time travel. Hmm. And I always say, if God wanted to share something with us that was so far beyond our realm of possibility, like we used to say five years ago, like like aliens, of course, we don't say aliens anymore because, you know, you could be at a mall in Miami and who knows what you're seeing. <laughs> but if God wanted to literally wake us up to something that we have absolutely no grid for, dreams is probably the best way for him to do it because it puts us in the scenario or it gives us clues. Now, what's interesting is in the dream, you didn't time travel to 1898, but there was discussion by the son of Trump and Barron is also a son of Trump about the only time they, meaning not him, wasn't Don Jr. It was somebody else. Could it have been Barron? We, we don't know. Is time travel possible? I mean, there's a whole lot of questions here, but only one time they went backwards, 1898. Well, Brian, are you coming up with anything here? <laughs> um, I'm I, I'm actually looking up uh, William McKinley to see if they had a picture of him or whatnot. Yeah. Um, Let me throw this in while you're um, looking. This was one other thing that I found, and I don't know if it's related at all, but there was actually uh, an overthrow of a government in the United States, and actually an actual coup d'etat, the only one ever recorded, and it happened in 1898 in Wilmington, North Carolina. And what happened was they were the most progressive city around as far as integration after uh, the Civil War, and Blacks had found their place in society in 
They were doctors, they were lawyers, they were now part of the government. They were elected in this certain year of 1898. And a faction of white supremacists got very nervous. They used the press to build a case that the black man was dangerous and he was going to take over. And they actually pulled an insurrection, pulled out the standing government and installed themselves. Now, you may have never heard this story before, and there's really a reason for it. The white supremacists were the Democrats. 100%. So I believe it has been buried because of that. Well, it's interesting because if you look up, I saw that too. If you look up the insurrection of 1898, people in the media, again, grasping for relevance in their own careers that are tanking because we know they're just nothing but a lying propaganda machine. We're trying to do what the media does, which is to stir up dissension. And they were trying in a desperate attempt to maintain relevance to compare the alleged insurrection, which was not an insurrection of January 6, 2021, where nobody got killed except one Air Force mom, wife, veteran who got killed by a Capitol Police officer. Nobody had weapons. Nobody fired anything. Nobody was violent whatsoever in any way at all people peacefully walked through the capitol they wanted to compare that to burning down of multiple buildings multiple people perhaps dozen they say as many as 300 african americans being killed and yeah. and african american businesses and stuff being looted i'm like you know what this sounds like this sounds like the black lives matter rallies a heck of a lot more and yeah. what they did in minnesota much more than it sounds like anything that happened at the Capitol during January yeah. 6th. Yeah, but and they, they really shouldn't bring it up because <laughs> it's their side that did it. Yeah. I what I forgot to mention this, that uh, many Black voters fled that city, and they say it set back integration for 75 years. So uh, that was a setback. So, Yeah. That was Charlotte, right? No, it was Wilmington. Wilmington. Oh, yeah. 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 Wow. That's kind of close to you. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, definitely set. They set back, um, you said. So that's interesting. 75 years. Mm -hmm. That definitely was some. Uh, anytime there's race related violence and, and, you know, just like the level of ignorance of, you know, white supremacy or black supremacy or whatever kind of race related stuff. It's just, it's demonically driven. Mm -hmm. It's, um, you know, the same spirit that, you know, the Nazis use to try to get people all frustrated and upset. I, I, I do think it's interesting that, um, you know, one of the classic things the devil does is to try to accuse and project. And that as difficult as, as, um, things have been in certain settings lately in our country, <clears throat> the there's been a huge move by the left to try to paint the white as being the alt-right, the Nazis, the white supremacists. And it has classically from day one of this country been the Democrats. I mean, to Thomas Jefferson stealing the election in the election of 1800, mail-in voter fraud from the state of Georgia, like, guys, look at your history, the party of oppression, the party of slavery, the party of the KKK, the party of the Jim Crow laws, the party that was opposed to civil rights, like it constantly has been the Democrats all along. And the reason why that the Democrats have even had the black vote was largely um, because of FDR. Because FDR would get in his car and he would drive around the country and his wife would too. And he would talk to the average person and he would sometimes take notes or his wife would take notes and she would be like, you know, run into an African-American uh, business owner who got kicked off of his land or whatever. And she'd write a note and she put it on the president's nightstand and they felt like they had a friend or an advocate in the White House. And back during those days, you know what? They probably did. Um, but the whole idea that it's kind of swung to, um, you know, what some people call the plantation, where they try to, you know, they try to harangue the African-American vote 
just in election years and the rest of the time they haven't done anything for the poor, the oppressed, the inner city, the and and not that all of that is 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 racially motivated. You can be poor, depressed, strung out on drugs and be a white or a, a white man or Hispanic or, or whatever. But people have tried to put that on particular colors and particular um, demographics. But the, the government in broad stroke has done absolutely nothing other than to make problems worse legislatively. And now I think there's a massive opening of the, I mean, you got like the mayor of New York who are saying, we don't want to be a sanctuary city anymore because <laughs> <laughs> now they're bringing in all of these immigrants and nothing against immigrants either. We love immigrants in this nation, but you got to come. There has to be a law and order. Yeah. You have to come in right. You can't steal your way into the country. And then the government is funding them, even though it hasn't funded our vets. It hasn't taken care of the homeless problem. It hasn't funded single moms or people of color or, you know, any type of demographic that has been classically um, looked over. But if we look at a whole possibility of new voters for, you know, this, it's a, it's really a conspiracy against the American people. And I don't think it's just about the vote. I think a large part of it is about the vote, but it's a hundred percent bribery, corruption, like yeah. from day one. There isn't any, any part about it that has to do with compassion, that has to do with the rule of law. It's not families in a large yeah. swath coming over it's not moms with little kids that just want a better shot at light it's 20 year old military chinese people chinese men and women and it mainly men you know and um and so now you got the mayor of chicago and you got the mayor of of you know you got the governor even of california mm -hmm. and you got the the governor and the mayor of the city of new york that are uh, you know governor of the state that are freaking out because abbott as he should was sending people like, oh, okay, well, you're a sanctuary city. Guess what? We're going to send you all the people that are crossing the border illegally. And now they're rethinking their policies because they actually have to live with them. And what I think is even more telling is there's an uprising in the, minor the minority American populations in those cities that are like, what about us? What about our gas prices? What about our food? Yeah. We're not getting subsidized by our government. And we got yeah. these people that are here five minutes that are staying mm -hmm. in first house at the government's expense and getting a free paycheck like what is going on yeah all right brian did you have yeah. a chance to look up some stuff there um yeah i looked up w william mckinley um hoping that it would that seeing him would remind me of the man in the dream um i can't say that it reminded me of him but i'm still kind of pondering the thought of you know the lord is is known to to use the cloud of witnesses to to appear not only in dreams and visions and encounters and so forth. So I wonder if because it was spoken, because the date was spoken and, and John was mentioning William McKinley, um, perhaps because it had to do with what was spoken and the statement. Um, and I did find something that I want to read, which I, I find kind of fascinating. <laughs> so apparently there was a a book written called the triumph of William McKinley. Hmm. And it says why the election of 1896 still matters. And then I want to oh. read this one overview, one page overview, uh, one paragraph. It says, uh, well, I'll read the whole thing. For many years, William McKinley's presidency was considered just mediocre by historians. He was, many of them believed, an executive who was easily controlled. Funny how it says executive, because uh, DJT is in the business world, businessman. Um, he was, many of them believed, an executive who was easily controlled by political cronies and who was pressured into war with Spain by the media and public outrage. Recently, though, presidential historians have begun to take a friendlier, more thoughtful examination of his presidency. A more modern view of McKinley's presidency is that he was a decisive leader who first put America on the, wor on the road to world power and ushered in the era of world leadership that we still enjoy today. 
McKinley's many difficult foreign policy decisions, especially his policy towards China and his handling of the Boxer Rebellion, coupled with his decision to go to war with Spain over Cuban independence, helped the United States literally enter the 20th century as a force to be reckoned with on the world stage. So I thought that yeah. a lot of words kind of stood out like, okay, that sounds a lot of like what DJT is being used in, has been, and will continue it. Wow. Um, and here is a sort of picture Um. Yeah. Who Who knows if if he was the man in the dream on the corner? Um. I also thought it was interesting that DJT was kind of on the corner, and then to his left was his son. Kind of like he's in his corner, if that makes sense. And I'm sure we can go with many many different ways in that. Um. The only other thing that was interesting was that. McKinley was the 25th president, not a major revelation, but I did receive this dream on the 25th as well. Hmm. Wow. Um, and I think that is all that I got at the moment. Wow. That is all really awesome, you guys. Um, so, um, John, could you kind of put a bow on this dream? I know that we're not really, we haven't plumb the depths of it, but um, probably for tonight, we've given people enough to think about <laughs> and mull over. Let me mention one other thing. Um, mm -hmm. There was a person that actually witnessed the assassination of McKinley, who was also mm -hmm. a person that witnessed the shooting of Grover Cleveland, or Garfield, I'm sorry, Garfield. Okay. Um, and Garfield got shot. I think he got shot in the stomach and then he languished for 80 days before dying. Um, <clears throat> and this uh, this person um, was actually asked by, by Garfield about his father's relationship to dreams and his own mortality. And it's interesting because this is actually the only surviving son of Abraham Lincoln, Robert Todd Lincoln. He saw the Lincoln assassination, the Garfield assassination, and the McKinley assassination. Oh, my goodness. Wow. And in that in-between time, he actually visited both McKinley. I think he visited both McKinley and Garfield between the time that they got shot and before they passed away. And it's interesting that huh. Garfield had said, did your dad ever have any dreams about dying in office? And he did. And I, I, I think that's just fascinating because it's interesting to me that if presidents could get intelligence about the future, especially related to their own course of what's going to happen in the future from dreams, they would be very interested in that information. But it's interesting to me, the relationship of the son of the president, and obviously there's DJT and, and Don Jr. in this dream. And again, the juxtaposition that this is not you know, this is not a hundred percent a reflection of what happened in McKinley's time. McKinley isn't in that Trump isn't in the same position at all that McKinley was. Um, <laughs> um, but but I I just do think it's it's interesting, even the apparition of Abraham Lincoln, like God gives Brian these dreams. What did you say when you about me related to this dream? Tell that part if you would. Yeah, I was looking for the right spot to mention that for the viewers. They're they're get a they'll get a good laugh. When I woke up from this dream, I just instinctively knew that God had given me this dream to give to John to share with him. Um, so it's it's nice to be used that way, Lord. Um, <laughs> <It's>... <laughs> and the Lord wants to get a message to John. <laughs> um, so uh, and I and I don't remember when our last interview was, but I believe it was. A few days before, um, I guess we can we can always double check that. Um, but I believe it's been about a month since our last interview, and so when when it came to mind, it was just fresh. You know, the fact that a date was given, that it talked about presidents, that it had to do with DJT and his son, 
And the fact that I had it and most of it, I was like, okay, what does this have to do with anything? What does this mean? I just felt like, okay, this is for me to pass on to John. So I think I reached out to Diana <laughs> first to to send it to you. And uh, and I made sure to draw the little diagram to, to help. So that's what, what it was. I really appreciate that. I, you know, I, I do find it interesting um, scripturally. Joseph had interacted with six dreams. Five out of the six had to do with farming and agriculture. Joseph grew up doing farming and agriculture. So sometimes God will give a dream to one person. It's like the bank shot. He'll give a dream to one person, knowing that they're going to go to somebody else for the interpretation <laughs> and knowing that that person who does the interpretation would know like the backstory of the Lincoln apparition, you know, whereas a lot of people could just look at this dream and be like, oh, well, you know, this is, a, you're going to stand before Kings. And there certainly is that identity piece. But there's the hidden parts of the dream, which is the he rede he reveals the deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness and light dwells with him. I don't know that we're going to know the depth of what's actually transpired historically in the Trump family and even what we're going through right now as a nation. I don't know that we're really going to understand what's happening right now. Because what the media says is a hundred percent, almost categorically across the board, a lie. Like if you watch the news and you live in the world of the media, you are so far deceived, completely away from reality. Like some of these international conflicts, they're not even real. They don't exist at all. You have friends that go to these countries and they go to the downtown and they're like, well, they said our whole downtown is blown up and I saw pictures online and it hasn't happened. Like we don't understand the the depth of the propaganda and the fake news and the disinformation mm -hmm. like the mainstream media cannot be trusted at all other than yeah. to lie to the American people. Unfortunately, much of the alternative media, not just the left, but also the right is in the same category, which again, this is why at the end of 2019, I said, God, show me the truth of the world. And I said, I am just going to follow the dreams. And I didn't do a whole bunch of research. I only did research based on the dreams God gave me, which led me into underground tunnels and adrenochrome and all of this stuff, you know, the operation paperclip and a real understanding of what's happening with the deep state. But to me, it sets a supernatural part of my journey because it all came through dreams. Mm -hmm. But I say all that to say that there is definitely a wink to something that we don't have the time and probably the answers to unpack with this 1898 piece. But I feel like the conversation of what you mentioned in Wilmington and about McKinley and even about the Baron Trump stories, there's something in the mix of that swirl that we may not even have a grid for, but a lot of times God will give us, see, a lot of times people think prophecy is 100% predictive, and a lot of times prophecy is confirming. When Joseph had the dream, the sun, moon, and 11 stars will bow down to you. Um, he didn't know until he was in in his probably in his own palace after interpreting the dreams of Pharaoh, did he realize, wait a minute, that was 13 years ago when I was 17, when I had that dream, sun, moon, 11 stars, that's 13 planetary bodies. That was a timetable of when I would be here. I don't think he was setting his watch by, all right, this is year 12, one more year in prison and I'm set to go. I don't think he saw it that way, but I yeah. bet there was one moment that he suddenly remembered those dreams of destiny when he was a kid. And it was like, oh, this is that just like nobody could finger Jesus as the Messiah from what like Isaiah said. But after looking back several thousand years to the life of Jesus and looking back a little bit further to Isaiah, yeah, he was a Galilean. Yeah. Nazareth. Yeah. Out of Egypt. Yeah. All these things that they said came true from our vantage point. But that's what this whole dream is about. This dream is about proper positioning mm -hmm. or relationship to adjudicate as the ecclesia and to see what it is that God wants us to see. 
And that was the confirmation. What what was the, before I completely wrap it up, tell me again, what was that part where you leaned over and you talked to your mom about something which gave you a confirmation? Oh, uh, at the very end, I noticed my mom was on the, the other table, which I didn't know she was there before. And I had just seen that the light at a certain angle was hitting the face of Don Jr., where his face looked translucent. He looked younger, like a younger version of DJT. And suddenly I see my mom there, and I notice that she was looking and seeing the same thing, which was a confirmation to myself that uh, if someone was bearing witness uh, that not only was I seeing that, but someone else was seeing it as well. Um, and I can't remember if she said anything, um, but I knew it was a confirmation, um, whether it was just the awareness of her seeing the same thing or her saying, yeah, I see it or, or whatnot. So. Well, it's obviously fascinating, a multi-generational confirmation of a multi-generational vision seer kind of sign right in front of you. And so that's that's absolutely fascinating that your mom is there. You look at her, you kind of just like the nod, like, you know, Hey, you see that. And and she gets it too, or you have that knowingness um, of the transformation. So the dream is about, first of all, for you knowing your positioning and knowing your authority. And it's a confirmation of your see your gift. Um, <clears throat> but it's also a confirmation and an invitation into the deep and hidden things. The statement from Don Jr. to you was an invitation into a riddle. And I we've touched again on the outsides of the riddle with the uh, Ingersoll Lockwood books, as well as McKinley and some of the things that happened in 1898. But I think there's more, and there's probably more that if you really, you know, I want to get those books now and read those books, especially the last <laughs> one, The Last President, and I want to read them and be like, God, is there something there? I routinely buy books and read them because of one symbol and one dream. And so <laughs> maybe I should get a set of three of them and send them to all of us. And we should read those books. In fact, I think I will. And we should read those books and just kind of see what God is saying. But first of all, the fact that you were there at the table, you were seated at the table is interesting. Um, and it's also interesting that you're in a diner, which is kind of a laid back atmosphere, but it's really kind of food on the road. It wasn't a state dinner. It wasn't Mar-a-Lago. It was almost as if you were traveling with them or you were meeting them to be there at a place that you were all eating out together with the president and with his son and with the two others the gentleman and the lady, and then of course, seeing your mom there as well. So I think it's, it's super interesting that level of closeness, um, possibly traveling. We don't want to assume anything that's not in the dream. You were clearly eating on the road somewhere um, because it wasn't your home, their home, the white house, anything like that. So being in that proximity is a very special thing to be able to have, have happen. Um, being able to sh to sit next to Don Jr. isn't that big of a deal if you guys are on the road and you're eating at a diner. Again, it's not like a state dinner, though it's representative of closeness, position, authority, things like that. But the fact that you shifted and then you saw something, I, I think that that is a message for the broader view of Anybody that'll listen, not just the prophetic, not just Christians, but, and maybe not even just Americans, but if you take a different seat, you're going to see Donald Trump in a different light hmm. and possibly in the light of heaven. I don't read into that statement, but sunlight is the light that comes from heaven. So I'm not, you know, saying anything that anybody wants to go down. I'm just saying possibly in the light of heaven, you'll see a man of strength and wisdom and you'll see a double dad and son. And you'll have to answer the question for yourself. What about the apparition of Lincoln? Does that mean that 
Donald Trump is is going to win or is going to come back or there's going to be another term or that his son is is the Trump name going to be hold the highest office in the land again? I, I think there are pieces of the dream that certainly point in that direction. I don't think it's definitive. I don't think it's saying, well, this means this. You didn't see him inaugurated. You didn't see him in the White House. You didn't see. And, and it doesn't have even the figurative flair of that, but it's a hint in that direction. Again, we're going to know soon. In less than a year, we're going to know what's happening in this next election and what transpired this whole year. And it'll be really interesting next year, a little bit after Valentine's Day, for us to look back and remember this dream and be like, yeah. man, did we get it right? Did what were, what were we seeing? Was it the apparition of Lincoln? Or was it the next generation? Or do we not know? Did things not, you know? But... <clears throat> I also think, um, and so that's the biggest part of the dream, being willing. Can you will, can you be willing to, because I feel like you kind of humbled yourself. You went from a, a seat right next to the prince to a seat across. Can we willingly shift our position, humble ourselves, and to allow God or the light of heaven to illuminate people that we will see them in a different way than we did before? And That's if, good, John. How, how does that change our perspective? And then what do we do in light of that? And then I think if you answer this for yourself, you'll know what to do because it'll tell you how to vote. It'll tell you, um, <clears throat> you know, this isn't a dream that says pray for Trump. This isn't a dream that says there's danger. This isn't a dream. There's a riddle in this dream and there's a mystery. And what I would like the listening audience to do is if, if you've had a problem with mean tweets, if you've seen the president and or his son in a certain light, allow God, can, can you be humble enough to say, God, I want your perspective on this man and his son and even his family and what the future of our nation needs, multi-generational. Wow. wow, that's really, really good, John. Thank yeah. you. Um, Brian, any concluding remarks that you would like to make? No, nothing else is jumping out at me. You just have a lot of wheels. Very progressive, yes. Yeah. Very progressive. I'm just constantly. I agree. <laughs> and please, audience, you put in the comments what oh, yes. you've seen and any insights you've received because your, your comments are great. They're um, really good. We can tell you're tuning in to the Holy Spirit and hearing from him. So, and that's exactly what we want to spark with doing these dream interpretations is for you to learn to hear God's voice yourself and to understand the flow of the Holy Spirit. So he's brilliant, he's wonderful, and he uncovers amazing things for us to know. So thank you so much everyone for joining us tonight. And thank you again, John. And Brian, for your time, I appreciate you both so very much. <laughs> and until we meet again, be blessed with his peace, his grace, and his great glory.